uh, it was probably wise, uh, even if, they, if Russia had more time to think about it, it would probably be wise not to get deeply involved in what could end up being a very messy situation. And secondly, that would require drawing down very serious Russian uh, military equipment and support, uh, f and which would inevitably affect the, the war in Ukraine. So it, it was probably a, a cautious decision, and maybe they figured it would be very hard in the long run to truly defend Assad. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I'm talking for the second time to Graham Fuller, a former CIA officer, geostrategic analyst, and a friend of Ambassador Chas Freeman. Graham has been looking at the development of the uh, of BRICS and of world affairs, and today we are talking on December on Monday, December 9th. Uh, he is in uh, in Canada, the East Coast, so for him uh, it is still Sunday, December 8th. But what we what has just unfolded is a uh, is a is a revolution basically in Syria, and I mean a revolution in the sense of uh, uh, really large changes in in all of West Asia. Um, I talked about this already with uh, with his friend Ch uh, Chas Freeman, and you can go and uh, watch that video first with uh, Graham. Though we need to touch very briefly on the on the Middle East, on West Asia, but then we want to talk a little bit more about the geostrategic implications for the incoming uh, uh, Trump administration. Graham, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Pascal. My pleasure. Graham, like let's start with Syria, but then we will we will branch out and go into what this also means for Russia. Um, now that Bashar al-Assad is gone, um, how do you think this changes the equation in uh, in West Asia? Well, I think this is one of the more complicated geopolitical situations in the world. There are so many factors at play. But uh, that's what the players in the region have to deal with, and so do we. Uh, fundamentally, I think there's a quick analysis that is tossed out, not inaccurate, that the big losers are uh, Russia and uh, Iran, and of course, Syria, and that the big winners are Israel and the United States. Um, I think that is probably true in the very short term, but anyone who follows the Middle East for very long realizes that no situation um, remains the same for very long. So I would say um, it's fine for people to have short-lived uh, feelings of triumphalism, but there are many hidden pitfalls uh, beneath the situation that we are maybe not yet uh, fully uh, and read readily aware of. The first, I would say, right off the bat, is that the United States does not have a good history of, of embracing, of playing both sides of the game with jihadist movements. Uh, it's sometimes worked with them, it's sometimes fought against them, but in general, these movements have never been under American control, and in the end, they often turn around and end up biting, uh, biting us. So I would just put the question, uh, will American interests be better off? And for that matter, will Israeli interests be truly better off with a jihadist regime that has had very close ties with al-Qaeda in the past? Uh, I think it's quite an open question and maybe pros and cons involved. I asked this question also to to Chess Freeman, but how is it possible that this uh, Islamist uh, um, grouping seems to be seems to be somehow get to get along with Israel and seems to even want to cut a deal with them? Why? Why these people and why not the, the moderate? I mean, the, the Assad regime was in for all intents and purposes, a secular kind of regime. Absolutely, it was. And uh, furthermore, religious minorities in Syria had far greater confidence uh, living under the Assad family than they ever than, than their great fears of an Islamist regime coming to power, which would be very difficult for Christians and Druze and Jews and all other sorts of groups. I think I think one of the clearest uh, factors here is that the 
new regime, jihadist regime in Damascus has to be very careful at this point. They've barely arrived. They don't know where the offices and where things are. They don't know how to run the country. So it would be very wise for them to make sure not to quickly alienate Washington and uh, and, and Tel Aviv, for that matter, uh, early on. Uh, that could launch uh, perhaps a, a, a negative reaction from Washington and Israel that could lead to their opposition to this new new jihadi movement in in Damascus that they don't want and are probably not prepared for or ready for. But I don't. I think I find it hard to believe that a quite serious Islamist movement is suddenly going to change its stripes and decide that, oh, well, it's fine to get along with Israel and the United States, and that this is part of a an Islamist agenda. That's just not real world. Then again, I mean, Saudi Arabia is, for all intents and purposes, also very Islamist, right? I mean, the Wahhabi version of, of Islam is extreme in, in terms of how it, how it um, demands adherence to its creed of 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 um, the Muslim faith, right? So, are we maybe seeing something like that emerging? Well, for one thing, I mean, if if I were a Christian or religious minority, non-Muslim minority living in Syria, I would probably rather live under Assad than I would under Wahhabi uh, controls in 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 um, Saudi Arabia, which are very strong on, on, of course, social controls, as they are in Iran, particularly women's dress and the kind of moral codes that are imposed. But beyond that, um, I doubt, I think that Saudi Arabia will have extremely mixed feelings about this uh, move, this success uh, of successful overthrow of Damascus by jihadis. Um, the the Saudis, among other, um, really dislike any kind of mass movements um, and or revolutionary movements, and this is indeed one of them. So, uh, and traditionally, Al Qaeda and other such movements have not been friendly to Saudi Arabia or to Jordan or to any other states that they perceive as being very close to the United States. So I doubt that the that that Saudis will feel comfortable uh, with uh, with this movement as well. But we still don't know. I mean, we haven't seen the the true colors of the regime. But I'm guessing that given its background of closeness to Al Qaeda and the general tenor of Islamist movements, they're very unlikely to be sympathetic or cooperative with Israel or with the United States, or even with Saudi Arabia, unless it's for to for protective purposes for the time being. So in a sense, what we are seeing here is just the beginning of more, or could be the beginning of more instability in Syria, right? Which is actually something that is, is in the interest of uh, Israel and also probably of the United States, as long as their oil fields in the in the the north uh, east are secured, which they st still seem to be. Um, the the question, though, Russia, do you think the Russians, this was the Rus a Russian decision not to further intervene and basically let Assad fall, except for taking him in uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a refugee? Yeah, well, that's a very good question, Pascal. I think I, I am guessing that the Russian intelligence was probably almost as surprised by the rapidity of the jihadi move uh, in just days from the northeast corner, northwest corner of Syria, all the way to Damascus, uh, everyone was was taken aback by that. Maybe even the jihadis, as the regime, uh, Assad regime, collapsed. But I think, on second thought, uh, it was probably wise. Uh, even if they, if Russia had more time to think about it, it would probably be wise not to get deeply involved in what could end up being a very messy situation. And secondly, that would require drawing down very serious Russian uh, military equipment and support, uh, and which would inevitably affect the, the war in Ukraine. So it, it was probably a, a cautious 
decision. And maybe they figured it would be very hard in the long run to truly defend Assad. Brian Berletic from the New Atlas uh, yesterday in a program, he, he his judgment is that uh, even great powers are don't have infinite power. And if the United States wasn't able to keep Afghanistan and basically had to withdraw to a to a Islamist uh, movement, a liberation movement, then this is might be the, the parallel now in in Syria. There's just there's just finite resources and the. Uh, the, for for the Russia, it's way more important to actually keep consolidating the win that what they've won in Ukraine in Europe rather than trying to divert uh, resources. Is that something that you think is likely to have been on, on the strategic calculation in Moscow? Yeah, exactly. That's sort of what I was trying to say. That I think it would be it would draw down too heavily on Russian military resources to get in, involved in a very uncertain situation in Syria where um, it could be quite an entrapment. And to my surprise and pleasure, uh, Trump and his advisors seem to have decided that they too did not really wish to become involved in, could, in what could be a very ugly uh, long-term uh, kind of uh, entrapment in the situation. And finally, the game is not over. I mean, Russia has some very significant cards to play. And I think um, they will probably feel that uh, they will be able to deal comfortably with whoever has come to power in, um, in uh, Damascus. Right. Um, Question, and this is the last thing I want to talk about Syria, but I, I wonder about this. We now have also a situation that might be problematic for the US and its NATO alliance, because on the one hand, um, we have one part, the northeastern part, which is controlled by the uh, Kurdish groups uh, uh, with the support of the United States. Also, then the US having the oil fields and so on. There's this tacit agreement. But then the rest now of Syria is controlled by groups very close to Turkey and that are explicitly hostile to the uh, to the Kurds. And uh, Erdogan in Turkey has been, of course, like the Turks are a major, uh, sorry, the the. Um, the Kurds are a major problem for him, and he's been he's been fighting against them, and he's been he's using these groups as 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 a proxies to fight uh, with the Kurds. But this now means that two NATO members, very important NATO members in Syria, are basically having opposite uh, interest when it comes to uh, the 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 landmass or the, the, what they, what they are what they are occupying, right? Or their proxies are occupying. How do you think that will play out? Well, I think you you you've. Uh pose the question quite accurately, Pascal. I would have to say that Turkey's number one goal, number one concern, geopolitical concern, is the Kurdish situation. And that probably takes priority over all others. So I foresee a po potential um, serious breaking point between Turkey and the new regime in Damascus Perhaps if Turkey seems determined to intervene, as I'm sure it will continue to intervene, to try to diminish or even crush the, Syri the Kurdish movement in, um, in northeastern uh, Syria. Uh, it may today the, the the jihadis in Damascus may accept it. They will maybe work with it, but in the longer run, uh, they will be. Uh, concerned about their own sovereignty and will not be happy with with Turkish military intervention uh, into parts of Syria over which the Syrian government seemingly doesn't even have control at this point. So that that won't work particularly well. And also, I mean, there are long historical memories. There's a love hate relationship between uh, Turks and 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 Syrians, as you know, Syria was long part of the Ottoman Empire, very significant part of it. I mean, even popular foods in Turkey today, as I just wrote in my blog that I'm I'm publishing shortly, um, two of the most popular kebab dishes both have names associated with Syria. There's halep ishi, which is sort of the the uh, the the dish of of Aleppo, and then the Damascus kebab, which is very very popular. So these are these are cultures that are quite linked, but 
but one is Arab and one is Turkish and one was under what the, the Arabs were under Turkish rule for a long time. So there's a little a little mixed mixed feelings there. I don't think this is necessarily a long term marriage made in heaven. No, no. I mean, it's it's uh, it, it more looks like uh, uh, a recipe to hell, right? To for for mass <laughs> violence in that region. I mean, it's so many so many actors now, and the Israelis are are, are already trying to annex more parts of the Golan uh, Heights. Uh, anyhow, um, but maybe let's leave that realm right now and and move toward this question of bricks. I mean, <laughs> yeah. If I if I could just add here, uh, Pascal, because I think it's significant. We've seen a great deal with with the tri triumphant success of Israel against Hezbollah and Hamas in in taking out their leadership. At least I don't want to say that the movements are dead. They're not dead, but they've taken out serious leadership. So this is, I think, created a kind of almost triumphalist feel within Israel of, of thoughts of greater, ever greater Israel, in which the boundaries are quite unclear. And you've had several far right figures, uh, Ben Gavir and uh, Smotrich and others, speaking of a greater Israel that talks about, uh, indeed, all of Lebanon, uh, all of, all of uh, Jordan, um, who knows how far uh, this would move up uh, into into parts of Syria? So I think I think um, the there there is going to be great concern on the part of of Syria, and not to mention, of course, Israel, uh, Jordan, and uh, and even Turkey to the, as to the extent of of Israeli greater Israel ambitions, and we just don't know that. But that will be, I, in my view, that will be true overreach for the Israeli state. Um, but now, I, I think so too, but uh, Israel is, is, is notoriously difficult to, to predict. Um, um, we now also have the situation in which uh, two members of the BRICS, uh, Iran and Russia, were severely, severely weakened, especially Iran uh, in in this area. And we have a BRICS partner aspirant, Turkey, which is majorly responsible for, for this happening. Um, at the same time, Turkey is a linchpin for both, for Russia, of course, and the Bosporus, and um, now with the influence in Syria, also for for Iran, something that just cannot, this cannot be ignored, but they are all now acting within the framework of BRICS. Um, do you think that this is a first major setback for BRICS, or is this something along along the lines of how BRICS has already been working with like uh, uh, strategic opponents like Iran and Saudi Arabia? Yeah, I think BRICS, of course, is at a very early stage of its development. Um, and as you know, Turkey is not quite yet a, a full partner, as I understand it. But um, the Erdogan is a very erratic type of leader. Uh, he's a remarkable leader, quite a remarkable, but sometimes foolish, I think, geopolitician. But he thinks in deep geopolitical terms. I mean, Turkey, as you know, thinks of itself not just as Turkey, but as a Mediterranean power, a Middle Eastern power, a Balkan power, a Caucasian power, a Central Asian power. They're even dabbling in Africa and things of that sort, a Muslim power. So I, I think that Turkey is maybe playing a risky game now vis-a-vis -vis Russia in this regard. Um, Russia cannot be happy with Turkey's support for uh, the, uh, the jihadi movement, which weakened Russia's position in, in the region. Uh, and I don't, I think, Erdogan is going to have to come to some terms with Russia as to how he is going to play this game uh, and which is the more important part. Is it to be part of BRICS and the advantages of dealing with Russia or the advantages of playing uh, games in, in Syria? My guess is that Russia is the more important player, for, even for Turkey. But maybe Turkey will just say, I'm sorry, apologize and go back to try to, trying to work more closely with Russia because BRICS does matter so much. I don't think this is any terrible blow to BRICS. 
but it's indicative of how as BRICS expands, inevitably, there will be groups and countries within it that um, will be at odds with each other in one sense or another. The great challenge for BRICS will be if it's capable of bringing together uh, countries that have had more hostile relations. We've seen that already with China, with its remarkable um, um, work in bringing together Saudi Arabia and Iran. Uh, do you think the uh, China will try to influence this process or whatever is happening now between Turkey, Iran and, and Russia uh, to mend ties? Or will will China keep out of this um, this very complex constellation now? It is extremely complex. I tend to think that China will will stay out at this point, partly because it is so complicated and China has bigger uh, games to play. I don't think China really would see this as a setback to BRICS. BRICS has so much more on, uh, on its agenda, uh, economic and developmental and uh, political work that is is trying to stay out of conflict, but to rather re resolve conflicts. I think in the short term, uh, China will probably opt to stay out. But as as this goes on, China may well feel it's it try to to try its luck with with bringing about some kind of rapprochement rather than military militarily involving itself on one side or the other. I really don't think China wants to do that at this stage. Thank you.